Hi. Hey, welcome to the show where I talk about things that I like for a, a long, a long time. <laughs> That's it. That's the entire premise of the show. I just talk about things that I like. And uh, today we're going to be talking about Animorphs because I really like Animorphs. Um, Animorphs was a book series that was originally written primarily for children and primarily for the Scholastic series by Catherine Applegate and Michael Clark. They wrote it as a duo, husband-wife author duo. It's very, very sweet. Anyway, I'm sorry if you can hear those. There's somebody dying out there. Um, but anyway, to the story. Animorphs was in my top reads as a kid because there were a, there were a lot of them. By the time I came to, to an age where I was interested in reading, I was in like sixth grade and every one of them had been published because they were published from 1996 to 2001 with a lot of companion books like Megamorphs and another one. I think there's like like 70 books total. Probably already said the right number and forgot it. So but the point is, is it was this, Fear Street, and Hank the Cowdog. Um, those were my big three as a kid. And I just adored the sci-fi adventure fantasy. And I know, like, Fear Street was, like, murder. And, like, ooh, uh, ooh, ah. But Animorphs could get dark. And to be perfectly honest, I mean, I, I liked the books once I read them. But the real reason anybody picked up a book was the cover. And Goosebumps had, like, these cool artistic covers. Fear Street had these cool, like, oh, somebody killed somebody covers. And Hank the Hank Cowdog had Hank the Cowdog. Animorphs just had this. And we all recognize this image. Everybody in my age bracket, everybody that I've ever known, knows what this is. And there there isn't an exception that I've found. Even if you've never read the books. And that's, that's some pretty iconic imagery, you know? And earlier I did mention the Ghost Riders, but I don't mean to, to mention that to, like, take away from the significance of these books, you know? They never hid away from the fact that a lot of these books were ghost-written. Um, as a matter of fact, there's special thanks in a lot of these books at the back of them, if you look, to the Ghost Rider. And most of them knew Catherine or Michael, and it was usually due to, like, Catherine or Michael being unable physically due to either health reasons or personal reasons to actually, like, finish the books more than an outline. And for that, I mean, you gotta respect that to an extent. In, a, in an industry and in, 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 in an era where, um, where people give a lot of shit to people who have their content ghost written, you just own it. And it suddenly isn't an issue anymore, you know? I'm sure it was an issue. I'm sure somebody decided to make a stink out of it once they realized how big the book series was getting, but either way. And uh, also, uh, preface, there was also apparently a live-action TV show that aired on Nickelodeon from 98 to 99. Um, didn't know that existed until I started researching for this video. I'm not going to be talking about that, but I may watch it at some point, just to see how terribly it probably held up. And um, also, fun fact, there is a live-action movie in the works for Animorphs. Turns out that uh, Catherine and Michael have since left the project due to creative differences on the show, which is always a great sign. It's always good when the original director or creators of, of, a, of a piece, of a, of a thing, leave because y'all are messing it up too fucking bad. So, we're just going to be talking about the books, and we're going to be talking about a lot of my own personal opinions. A lot of it's not objective fact, so if you came for that, sorry. Now, I've mentioned it before, like I mentioned it at the top of the video, that Animorphs was a lot darker than a lot of other kids' shows at the time, or kids' books, primarily in the way that it did not shy away at all from the, the fact that there was war. I mean, that was the point of the book, the story. <clears throat> was about war at its core, at its absolute, like, center. It was about war and the horrors that it causes, about the tragedies that the characters face and how they have to overcome them. And the characters are the best thing about this book because due to the nature of the story, they all change. They, they all grow. They all become more, you know? They start out as very tropey, very 90s. It's still very 90s, even at the end of it. But it's just like, oh, there's Jake, the popular guy. There's Rachel, the popular girl. Tobias, the shy loner who happens to also be attractive enough to attract Rachel, the popular girl. You get my point. It's very tropey. But, with, you know what, let's start with Tobias. 
So Tobias is the shy bully magnet. Like he's just like, oh, I'm so sensitive. Oh, I'm, I don't like people. He's very emo, you know, coming from a place of where I used to be. The fact is that he is immediately given consequences. He is immediately shown. Also, fair warning before I go any further because I just realized I hadn't said it yet. There will be spoilers. I, I don't shy away from spoilers because I don't think at this point that this is something that people are going to be like dying to read. It's been it's been on the market for 20 it's been completed for 20 years. Like you, you've had your chance. Anyway, in the very first mission in the very first if I'm remembering correctly book, Tobias stays in the form of a red-tailed hawk. And to give a brief rundown of what that means is so they're granted the power to morph and they can morph into any animal that they've touched and they all kind of get into the groove. They start touching different animals, storing the DNA. Tobias gets a red tail, red tailed hawk and is using it to scalp and he ends up either captured or trapped or something. And he is stuck in this form for the remainder of the series because he stayed in for two hours, which is too long in most other kids series. At some point, he would have had a happy ending. At some point, he would have gotten back his human body, and that would have been his, like, real body, you know? Animorphs doesn't give, give a shit about your feelings. Um, he is a hawk for the rest of the series. There are several times in the series where Tobias actively tries to commit suicide um, by flying into glass and trying to kill himself that way, and then he disassociates and loses himself to the mind of the hawk and goes into the woods and lives for a few days and desperately wants to bang a female hawk. It's really fucked up. Like, it's really messed up. At the, at the end of the series, him and Rachel are, like, together, right? They, they've attracted each other over the course of the series, and they're just like, oh, wow, I sure do love you, Tobias. Thanks, Rachel. I sure do love you, too, even though I'm a hawk. Um, but then it doesn't work out. <laughs> Like, not that they break up. No, 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 no. I mean, they were they were meant to be, obviously. But Tobias A still can't be a person. He can morph back into a human later. Like, he, can, he regains the ability to morph after losing it. But he, I guess the best way to put it would be, is now a hawk. Like, that is who he is. That is his true body as far as the morphing is concerned. Meaning he always has to turn back, back to the hawk. So even whenever he goes back to human to spend time with Rachel, he's not a human. He is a hawk, and he has to go back to that. But then, okay, let's talk about Rachel real quick, since we're seeing a natural progression here. Rachel is, once again, like the talented, like, oh, I do gymnastics, and I'm hot, and I'm strong, and I'm, oh, fuck yeah, dude, I'm cool. That's her character. And it starts out very much like she's just a Heather. Like, she is the number one bitch. She's bad bitch. Um, and she will take you down. But that very quickly escalates for Rachel. She very, very quickly starts reveling in the excitement of battle. And morphing and, like, ripping things limb from limb. Killing people. And she's just, like, at first, just, oh, it's just adrenaline. I'm just excited. It's just because it's a natural thing. My body's dealing with it that way. But as the series progresses... It is outright stated that Rachel cannot live in a world without killing. Like, when the war's over, she doesn't know if she's going to be okay not being able to kill people. Several times in the series, Jake uses her as a weapon. Like, directly, because he knows that she will kill people. But Jake actively uses her as a weapon against the Yurks, which are the aliens. I haven't said them yet because I'm all over the place in this video. I've got a script, but I'm not really following it because I'm an idiot. But the point is, is that it's not hinted to. It's not alluded to. It is directly stated that Rachel has gone from, oh, well, maybe, you know, I just get excited to, I just like to kill. It's alarming, but I like to kill. I like to murder. And she never shows remorse for her kills. Like, she shows remorse for feeling no remorse, but she's never just like, oh, I wish I could have saved them. No, she's fine with it. She's totally chill. And to be perfectly honest, I, I, she needed to be. Like, it's just how it is. Now, going from Rachel to Jake, Jake is your typical, like, reluctant leader. 
He's also, he's related to Rachel, he's their cousin. And he's also very much the, I'm tall and handsome, and I'm a good guy, I save people from bullies, I don't bully, that kind of thing. And he's reluctant to be the leader at first because he doesn't want that responsibility. But then he's given a very good reason in order to get like that leadership position and take it seriously, and he becomes a good leader. And I mean that very, like, legitimately. He makes very hard decisions a lot of the time. He questions himself, but then ultimately does decide to go with the more pragmatic option. For being kids, for being teenagers, the Animorphs make some of the best war decisions that I can think of in, like, modern media. Because they're not making decisions like... A good example would be Supernatural, right? So in Supernatural... There are several instances where if Sam or Dean was dead, the entire world would be saved. But instead, they just don't kill each other because there's gotta be a way. Now, untold thousands are dead because of that decision because you liked that person that you saved. But you could have just killed them and been done with it. And not have killed that many innocents. Animorphs don't think that way. They will straight up murder a thousand people if it means saving ten thousand people. And the number one example of that, honestly, is Marco. Because Marco starts out as your, oh, look at me, I'm a silly little joke boy, Ooh, comic relief, nothing I do is for real. But it turns out he's just doing that to kind of mask his underlying misery and depression. Um, I believe a quote from him is something along the lines of, if life is going to be nothing but tragedy or comedy, I'd rather see everything as comedy. And... Okay, that's a little dark, but it also gets darker because Marco is pragmatic. And I, I, I mean it like meth methodically pragmatic. He is far, far more ruthless than like you would ever guess at the beginning of the series. Because he's always looking at the bigger picture. The, these kill a thousand to save ten thousand. That's Marco. And there are several points in the story where he's just like, yeah, we can do that. It'd kill a few innocents, but... I mean, fuck it, it'd do the right, it'd do the job. And that's wild to me, because it's it's true. Like, that's how military tacticians and commanders have to be. But they don't really show that in a lot of media. They don't really show that that is exactly how people are, or they need to be in these scenarios, because why? Because that would make you look like the bad guy. You know, you're still killing people. It's the trolley situation all over again. Moral ambiguity, but Marco is very much against that and he also has consequences and stakes which only reason i'm not going into it with all of these characters is because there's a whole section for it coming up next so just hold on for a second um and then you have cassie arguably everyone's least favorite member of the bunch and that's because she's the most necessary cassie is the most inherently good member of the animorphs she wants to do the least harm bring the most good do the most things right by all. She's very much a, tr a tree hugger stereotype where she just doesn't want to be violent and solves things through nonviolent, pacifistic ways. And it, it, it shows how most of the time that only backfires. I mean, at one point in the story, she gives the Yurks, once again, the evil aliens, the ability to morph. She gives one of them that because she's using it as a peace offering because hopefully they'll just leave everyone alone then because they just want a new body. The Yurks then take that ability and use it as a weapon of war. Peace don't work all the time, Cassie. And she still keeps, like, she's still the moral compass of the group, of course. She's still the one that keeps everyone together and holds their, like, bond, I guess. And, and Jake really wants to, like, be with her as well because that's his love interest. Because everybody has to love it. Have, have a... Everyone has to have a love interest in these, like, early 90s things. But I think my absolute favorite moment with Cassie, as actually in regards to her saving, I believe saving the life of somebody else. I don't remember the details. I'm very sorry. But she turns into a caterpillar. And she stays as, as a caterpillar for two hours, making her stuck in that form. And so she is now, the term is nothlet, which means that you can't turn back. You're, you trapped yourself in that form, whether accidentally or on purpose. And as a caterpillar... She can still thought speak because they all have telepathy as animals, but she can't turn back into a human. But then she undergoes a metamorphosis as a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. That butterfly, when she hatches, has reset its biological clock, meaning she can turn back 
into a human. Now, two things. One, that's some deus ex machina shit, but I... Oh, it's so good! Because two, just the science behind how caterpillars turn into butterflies is already wild and crazy enough, right? Because caterpillars literally turn into liquid inside of their chrysalis. I mean, they are goo. They are actual liquid goo with the semblance of thoughts and consciousness bouncing around inside. This goo somehow, and science isn't really sure how, this goo somehow reforms into a butterfly and then hatches. And it is a completely different organism than the caterpillar. And the fact that, that it goes so deep in the Animorphs universe, at least, that it is an entirely different creature with entirely different DNA is fantastic writing, in my opinion. That is the best way to do a deus ex machina, and I love it. I adore that. That's great. And then we have Axe, or as his name is actually, actually, Aximile Iskoroth Iskro? Aximile Eskoroth Istu is his full name, and for the sake of brevity, we'll, we'll just be doing Axe, because that's what the Animorphs do, that's what he comes to accept as his name. But the point is, is, is Axe is an Andalite. He is one of the aliens who possess the ability to morph and are the ones who are fighting the war with the Yurks that the humans get caught in. Or really, that the humans get saved in, if you want to look at it that way. But Axe is alien. And he feels appropriately so, both in the understanding of the way things are, and also in how he reacts to certain things. Because, for instance, Axe, as an Andalite, has no mouth, has no blah, 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 doesn't have it. He also doesn't have a sense of taste because he doesn't have a mouth. So when he, when he becomes a human, he gains this new sense. He gains a whole new sense that he didn't know existed, and he's overjoyed by it. And And I mean that, like... It, there's several times where he's just like, I just love tasting things. I love it. I love chocolate and onions and cigarette butts, and I'm not kidding. Point is, is that he is blown away by this new sense, and putting myself in that context, in that perspective, I would be too. Imagine, right? Like, you're, you don't have, we don't have one of our five senses, right? We consider that a disability. So imagine if there was a sixth sense, a third eye even, but like just another sense that we're not aware of at all, that we're suddenly given the ability. It'd be like we were living, like, disabled in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a state of disablement for the entirety of our lives and suddenly we're able to no longer be. And admittedly, in the human form, for some reason, Andalites lose the ability to thought speak. I don't really know why that is. It's not really explained, but... The point is, is that he go he goes bonanza with it, and then just making sounds with his mouth, repeating words because they sound good to his lips and to his tongue. It's neat. It's a very good concept. And Axe as a character is probably the most complicated, because really, at the end of the day, if there was one Animorph that the story was about, it was about Axe. Because Axe has the most at stake, really, because he's had the most at stake the longest. But Axe is torn constantly between staying on Earth and going back to the humans, like siding back with the Animorphs. And most of the time, he doesn't do it. He he battles with it. He's just like, oh, well, should I? I'm not an Animorph. And they're like, yeah, you are. He's like, no, screw you. I'm an Andalite. And then he goes to join the Andalites, and that backfires, and he comes back. He's like, a, he's, he's, he's Morgana from Persona 5, but written better and written more understandably. But the point is, is that he's complicated. He's never really sure what he fully wants. And he's kind of an arrogant douche a lot of the time, too. Like, he's not necessarily a good person because he's just a jerk. But he doesn't mean to be. He's like a, he's like a rich kid who's got a heart of gold, but he just doesn't know better. And there are a lot of other side characters that have way more depth than I ever would, would have thought. But, like, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to go too far into them. You have traitorous animorphs. You have disabled kids. You have... Ba -ba -ba. You have characters like Marco's mom, Ava. Ava is probably my favorite because she's presented immediately as a high-ranking Yurk. The highest ranking of Yurk. And he is possessing her body, or it is possessing her body. They are, the Yurks are genderless by default. So, whenever they finally manage to get the Yurk from Marco's mom, Marco's mom is pragmatic and conscious enough of the scenario that she knows that 
if Visser 1, who is the one that was in her brain, were to die, then the next up would be Visser 3. And Visser 3 was a bloodthirsty, warmongering psychopath where Visser 1 just wanted to understand everything. He wanted to assimilate, not necessarily peacefully, but a lot more peacefully. Less destruction, more coexistence and cohabitation. So, she lets him back in. And then later on, she is freed, but then Visser 3 does the exact same thing they were fearing and starts blowing stuff up. Either way, the point is, is that she is very similar to her son in the way that they're both looking at the big picture. And I love that. I love that. There's also a character named David. Uh, he betrays the Animorphs. I think his name was David. Mostly sure. I'm going to check that later. Because he, he has a, he has a, a short little section later. Because uh, he ends depressing. Which, you know what? Let's just go ahead and get into it. So yes, that character I mentioned, his name is David. David was a character that was introduced to add to the cast of the Animorphs. Sort of. Because he immediately betrays them and runs off with the morphing ability, then is trapped in the body of a rat on an abandoned island, where, passer where passerbys in boats can hear his psychic screaming for months afterwards. Already, that's bad enough. But then later on, David somehow finds Rachel. I don't remember how. And he literally begs her, as a rat in thought speak, to kill him. To apt to kill him. To end his life. He assisted suicide this. To which, in most books, even adult books, they'd be like, No, we can save you. Or, no, you've learned your lesson. Or, no, this blah blah blah. No, Rachel kills him. Like, she just, she just straight kills him. And there, that, that shows that there are real stakes and consequences, because also, a lot of the Animorphs have real stakes and consequences to play in the story. Um, let's start with Jake, because we find out early on that Jake's brother is possessed by a Yurk. His older brother, Tom, is possessed by one of the Yurks, one of the aliens. And that's his motive for fighting. He is invested. But then, getting into, getting into hard spoiler territory in this section... But, but then, they never save his brother. Never. Not once do they save, like, fully save his brother. He is never, at any point, a good guy. They kill him at the end of the story, as a matter of fact. Like, he's dead. And then, at one point, I mentioned the disabled... I mentioned the disabled children. The disabled children are children given powers by the Animorphs that cure their disabilities as long as they're not genetic or pre-existing. Um, and so in return, they fight on the side of the Animorphs. Well, Jake cures them and then immediately sends them on a suicide mission. And they die. They die. Like, he kills 17 disabled kids. And like, okay, sure, <laughs> why not? Uh, then Rachel, for uh, for another good example, is one of the main characters. Main characters were immune to, to harm back in the day, especially in kids' media. Rachel dies at the end of the story. And I don't mean like, oh, she just, you know, she dies off screen. They find her body, hit very Harry Potter. No, 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 no. They kill her on screen from her perspective, if I think, if I'm remembering correctly. And then they later on have a scene where Jake has to identify her body and she's cremated. They go through the whole thing, the whole shebang. And the fucked up part is she wanted to die. <laughs> she wanted to die because she couldn't return to a world where she was not allowed to kill. I mentioned that earlier. I mentioned it earlier that she was that into killing, that into murder. But I cannot stress enough that she literally volunteered for a mission that she knew was going to kill her because she could not bear to live in a world that no longer allowed her to murder. That's kind of fucking dark. Tobias is trapped as a bird, and as that bird, he goes through a lot, as, as I've mentioned. But even more, because at one point he's tortured, like in a cage, electrocuted and, 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 and stimulied to his brain. And he never gets over that. He actually has real, like, he has to deal with the PTSD of these things. And he can't a lot of the time. It's, it's, it's so refreshing to see children's media have growth for these characters. And then you have Cassie. 
But then Axe also comes to respect a lot more from the humans and pretty much all of Earth. He comes to understand a lot more and comes to not view himself quite as arrogant or quite as good as everything else. He really develops his moral compass over the course of the series, too. And his older brother, uh, first off, forgot to mention this, is Tobias's dad. That's revealed at some point. And so he, because he became a a a human a human nothlet but then the elemist who is basically god uh who we'll get into in a little bit but the elemist is the one who's the driving force for good found axe's brother took him reverted his time to back when he was an andalite erased his memories of tobias or tobias's mother and put him back into war to in order to fight with like with the thing that he's fighting I, the evil whatever um what <laughs> it's just it's just like okay well then they find that out and they're just like neat bro high five ha <laughs> but it, it's just it's so impressive that there are real stakes in this show for kids and with this i keep saying show in this book for kids, in this in this written show for children, there are real stakes. There, there's a lot at stake, even, and it's just it's just fun. It's it's fun, especially as an older reader, to see how dark it could get. Because even at the end of the story, they go to to the to, to outer space in their new ship, which they named the Rachel. <laughs> Um, and they, they find Axe, who has been missing, assimilated into a hive mind known as the One. And they imply, <laughs> they imply that Jake, in his final order of the, sh of, the, of the show, of the written show, orders them to ram into the One's ship. And that's it. We don't know if they live. So it's implied, based on the history of the show, that that was the final that that was the final order Jake had ever given. And that's that's just cool. Like, I understand it's not for everybody. I understand that for a very long time, dark and gritty became synonymous with bad, but that's cool. That's really cool. <laughs> so now to kind of talk about just the world in general, because it's very unique, honestly, especially in the way that aliens are presented. So the primary two aliens we have are Andalites and Yurks. Andalites are good, Yurks are bad. Andalites are hyper-advanced, super powerful, and they own most of the known galaxy, as far as I'm aware. Yurks were parasitic slugs living in little monkey host bodies that couldn't see very well. But they were very intelligent, they just had to have a host. So, I'm going to tell the story of why the Yurks are destroying the, the galaxy right now, or enslaving it. And that's because the Andalites came to their planet, offered them a treaty. For no reason, apparently. They just were just like, hey, yeah, we'll ally with you. We'll just, yeah, yeah, sure, we're friends. And then after a few years, the Yurks, quote, rebelled, which is important. That's an important word. And overthrew the Peace Council on the Yurk homeworld, took some of the Yurk bodies, some of the Yurk ships, and they flew off into space, conquering galaxies and galaxies for their new bodies or, or solar systems, either way, for new bodies. And so I want to I wanna go ahead and say that that's a pretty good villain story. Like, they're just parasites. They just want new bodies. They want new hosts. That's good. I, I can respect that. That's a, that's a good reason on its own. But then you look into the word choice, the specific word choice, and the way that things went about, and you start to wonder if the Yurks were slaves. Um, because the Andalites, first off, didn't have to reach out and give them a treaty at all. They literally saw a less developed people and went, Alright, we're friends now. And the Yurks had to say yes, or they would have been killed, most likely. But then on top of that, they specifically say the Yurks rebelled against the Andalites. That's a, a good word choice if you're enslaved, not if you're in peace treaty. Like, you're not tied and, like, you're not friends. I don't have to rebel against my friends to do something, you know? But then three, it gives more motivation for the Yurks to do the things they're doing because they want to have enough power in order to kill the Andalites, to de destroy their oppressors. I'm not saying the Yurks are good guys. I'm saying that the Yurks are probably not as bad as they're made out to be by our perspective. 
It's, you can really, it's overthinking. It's all it is, is overthinking. But then there's also a lot of other smaller aliens, and, like, there's squid aliens who I don't remember. There's itty-bitty microscopic aliens that I don't remember. There's a lot of depth to the world, and then you have characters like the Elemist, who's God. He's basically God. He, he was a different race of aliens who were all gamers, and these gamers gamed so hard that the planet was destroyed because nobody else could play their game. And I wish I was kidding, but I'm not. The Elemist and the last remaining members of his people crashed on a moon. And on that moon, a giant sponge tentacle monster, it, 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 it sponge because he absorbs memories and information, killed everybody other than him. They he killed them one by one and absorbed their thoughts and memories as he'd been doing for thousands of years with other races over time. And then he kept the Elemist, who was then known as Tommen, I believe. Um, he kept him to play games with him. And he played games, and he played games, and eventually the Elemis started winning. And then started absorbing the knowledge from him. Also, I just want to point out, the Elemist... Elemist? That name? Is his gamer tag. <laughs> but he absorbs so much knowledge that he ascends into godhood. But the Elemist discovers a great evil, and they just, they start having a game. Like, they because they start battling initially. Like, they start, like, punching each other, like, DBZ style. But they're too powerful, and they risk threatening the integrity of the universe, of, of space-time. And so they're like, fuck it. Let's just use other people. Let's just pick them up and use them. Fight them. And they do, for the rest of eternity. And the Yurks and the Andalites are just the current good versus evil struggle that they've been having for their game. So God is playing a game with us. That's the point of this. That's the the idea, is that we are just playthings of God that he can throw around at his leisure. It's leisure. Also, while we're on the point of, like, just implications of the world and things like that, at one point I did mention that Tobias really wanted to have sex with a female red-tailed hawk. Um, this is something that raises a lot of concern. Yeah. Because it means that all of the other Animorphs really want to have sex with animals. Um, and that's, that's, I, I'm not going to go further than that, but I'm going to let you picture that because I, di I didn't want you to have a good night. Um, but while we're on the concept of morphing, the cube, known as an Epsilon, Epskillian, ep Epskillian device, something, I'm going to call it the cube. Um... The cube is how they gain the ability to morph, and the cube is explained fairly well, honestly. Because, basically, it uses cellular regeneration technology, which is a load of shit for modern, or even, especially, like, 90s technology. Basically, it could rapidly generate cells, and it would store excess matter, or your excess matter, in the case of a smaller morph, in a different pocket dimension known as Z-space, which is basically hyperspace because it can be accessed by ships. And it pulls this matter, this mass, whenever you morph, or it stores it. Either way, that matter is used and distributed to fit the morph. And that is surprisingly well thought out for a kid's book from the 90s, you know? Like, that's surprisingly detailed and intricate, and I kind of love it. Be just because it's so unnecessarily detailed. Also, the fact that there are also um, <sighs> espers or es epscons or something, basically naturals at morphing. And they talk about how these morphers can do it like that. They can do it fast. And Cassie, for instance, in the Animorphs, is one such individual. Um, there's another character that's mentioned... And she is called a morph dancer because she can morph so fluidly and rapidly between each of her forms that it looks like she's dancing. That, that, uh, you get my point. It's really cool, and I like it a lot. So with all of this praise, you may be thinking, oh, well, Luke, is it perfect? It sounds perfect. And I, I, I really wish I could say it was. Even, like, contextualizing it for a younger audience, I wouldn't say it's perfect. It's great. Do not mistake me. It is a solid 9 out of 10, but it is not perfect. Due to the Ghost Rider situation I mentioned before, there's a lot of small inconsistencies that slowly add up, like injuries during morphing and how they affect your real body. You have um, the, the best example of the whether you heal or you don't heal during the morph is when Axe talks about how most Andalites would rather die than live without their tail. But with the humans, if they morph into something and then morph back, they heal. 
So why doesn't that work for Andalites? Is it just a difference in biology? Because I think it's not. I think it's not. And then from there, you also have a question that I, I'm curious about, which is why can't humans use thought speak? Humans are just another form of animal. And it's not an intelligence factor because Yurks are intelligent. Humans are intelligent. Andalites are intelligent. But two of those can use thought speak and one of them can't. And I don't know what is the reason for separating it unless it's vocal speech but even then i think there's still I, th I think there's still aliens that use vocal speech other than humans there may not be that may be the reason don't really accept that that's a bad reason but i mean it's still something at least if that's the case but the point is is there's a lot of inconsistencies there's also a lot of tonal incongruency um it'll go from like the horrors of war have taken us they they're too much to bear. We are no longer children. We are warriors. To guys, holy shit, the cigarette butt is delicious. Um, nom, 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 nom. Like that kind of thing, you know? Like it's it's very bouncy with how it presents its topics. It doesn't want to stay dark for too long, but it also doesn't want to not be funny. And also it's very 90s, like it's very 90s. There's a lot of old gender stereotypes that don't really hold up that well. There's a lot of old just ways of talking and most of it very much is definitely written from the perspective of an adult who thinks they know what kids sound like not knocking the writing because for the time for that age it was good but it's just very very tropey in a lot of ways and it's not really something i hold against it but it, it doesn't it keeps it from being perfect perfect can't would let me try that sentence over that sentence wasn't perfect but perfect can stand the test of time animorphs largely does but not all of it. That being said, I think I would 100% recommend these these books to a young reader trying to get into sci-fi or just trying to read something new or exciting in general because they are interesting, unique, powerful, really, whenever you get down to the core concepts, books that I, I feel like are fading from the public consciousness other than the wacky covers. And so I, I, I just legitimately believe that anyone who is starting out in their reading adventure should consider these books. Also, fun fact, um, there was at one point a line of toys for the Animorphs that flopped so hard, they actually had to rebrand them as Beast Wars toys. They were the Beast Wars Mutants line. And one of the, there was a red Andalite in the Beast Wars Mutants line who was called Inferno Creature. But Inferno was already a character in Beast Wars. <laughs> so they just fucked up everyone. They just fucked up everyone. I didn't know where to put this in the video, so I just, I just felt like I put it at the end. <sighs> I should cover Beast Wars at some point. That'd be cool.